that one of the things the two of you so have in common is that you're storytellers. Um, youth before age. <laughs> Wait, was there a question? Yes, in there? I'm meaning that um, I think that even when you write academic, you're both academics, you're both professors, you're both teachers, but when you write your academic work, and you're a playwright and a poet and a memorist, and you as well, you're always telling stories. Yes. And that's very different from a lot of academic pursuits sometimes, right? Well, my, my father, whom Wally knew, um, was a fabulous storyteller. He was uh, hilariously funny. My father was so funny, he made Red Fox look like an undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved stories, and he communicated in stories. And where I grew up in eastern West Virginia, everybody told stories. But if you, uh, it's a little bit like Zora Neale Hurston when she went back to Eatonville in Florida. But first of all, Professor Harris, I had never heard the prodigal son sung outside of Walden Methodist Church till today. And that is my favorite, favorite hymn. They, the choir sang it at my mother's funeral. Uh, so uh, God bless you for doing this. And when, um, when I was a graduate student, I was his student. I, I studied history at Yale um, as an undergraduate. And then I got a fellowship to go to the University of Canada. I got a Mellon Fellowship. I was the first African-American to get a Mellon Fellowship. My father, and I called him, and I called my parents. When I was growing up, I wanted to go to Harvard and Yale, or Yale, and I wanted to go to Oxford and Cambridge, because on TV, that's where they said smart people had gone. And my, my father's first cousin had graduated from Harvard Law School in 1949. So that was sort wow. of in the family um, lore. And his wife, who was black, got a PhD in comparative literature in 1955. So that was sort of that. Then I wanted to go to Oxford or Cambridge because Rhodes Scholars went to Oxford. And um, so I applied to all these fellowships. I applied to Theresia seven fellowships. Wow. And I was a finalist for all these fellowships and I wasn't getting any. I was a finalist for the Rhodes, the Marshall, the Fulbright. I, so my girlfriend, who was Linda Darling, who was the some of you know Linda Darling Hammond up at Stanford. We were junior item at uh, <laughs> Yale. And she said, just go in there and be yourself. Stop trying to pretend to be somebody you're not. So I went in, I was my own um, little funky self. And I got the fellowship, I got the Mellon Fellowship. And it was one of the happiest days of my life. And I went back to Calhoun College at Yale. And I called my parents and my father answered the phone. I said, daddy, daddy, put mama on the extension phone, remember? In those days, you didn't have two phones. You had a phone, the extension phone. And she was upstairs, and Daddy was downstairs. And I said, Mom and Daddy, you'll never believe it. You'll never believe it. I got a Mellon Fellowship. I'm going to Cambridge. I'm at Mellon Fellowship. And Daddy said, I said, I'm the first Afro-American, remember, this is 1973, to get, to get a Mellon Fellowship. And without missing a beat, Daddy said, you're the first Negro to get a Mellon Fellowship? I said, yeah, Daddy. He said, huh, they're going to call it the Watermelon Fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> That's my father. <laughs> so when I came of age as a graduate student, post-structuralism, deconstruction, they were the discourses that were reigning supreme. And my brother, I only had one brother, no sisters. My brother's five years older, Paul. He's an oral surgeon. And he heard me speak, and he said, when are you going to um, write something that mama and daddy can understand? Mm. And that really... Um, that moved me. And I went down right at the same time I was asked to uh, give a talk at an honors seminar at Howard University. I completely forgot this. And so I gave a talk called Binary Oppositions in Chapter <laughs> One of Frederick Douglass's Narrative. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, I was in my stride, man. I was reconstructing and deconstructing and everything was cool. And um, at the end of my hour presentation, I had very polite applause, uh, and then I said, I'll take questions. And a young black man in the back, it was, everybody was black, you know, it was Howard University. He, I said, yes, sir. And he said, yeah, brother, all we want to know is, was Booker T. Washington Uncle Tom or not? <laughs> <laughs> that was a polite way for the tradition to tell me to, um, as Alice Walker put it, stop talking as if I had books in my mouth. And I, so I tra trained my students. We had to know about theory, but you have to know how to say it in a language that your parents can understand. 
And I think that's a good lesson for all of us. So. Absolutely. No, you know, when you're speaking, um, saying what you wanted to do, what you ended up doing, um, I suddenly remembered something I'd forgotten for donkey years, that in fact it was to an American university uh, that I first applied when I decided I wanted to study literature. Mm -hmm. And why did I pick uh, America? I was told that America was awash with scholarships, whereas the British were very mean <laughs> with theirs. <laughs> You hardly ever could extract a scholarship out of a, a British university. So I remember now that as I was leaving school, I applied to, you said you applied to 700 fellowships. I think, oh, you know, post, post was quite cheap at the time. <laughs> so I think I mailed at least 77 applications <laughs> to various universities. I just got the directory out and started applying. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, I got the admissions all right, but not one offer of a scholarship. <laughs> so I went back to, uh, to my university college, and fortunately, I was able to get um, um, uh, a scholarship, which uh, took me to Leeds. Now, how did I get to Leeds? By the time uh, the scholarship came from my, you know, um, colonial government, not the British, but they who were just moving slowly towards independence at the time. By the time I got the, admis uh, the scholarship, I got that first, before I had a place to go to. So um, the question was, where did I want to go? Now, you know, the three main uh, universities that we knew of, we colonial uh, creatures at the time were Oxford, Cambridge, and London. Mm -hmm. And my university college was actually part of London. So I said, well, I'm already in the University of London, so let me try the other two. Um, tried Oxford, tried Cambridge, mailed the letters. I never even heard from them. <laughs> 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 so I brought out the, um, the map. <laughs> and I remember and I sat with one of my um, yeah. uh, teachers, uh, Dr. Mark. And I remember he asking me, why are you looking at uh, a map? I thought you said you wanted to go and uh, study um, English literature. Um, what has geographic got, geography got to do with it? So I said, well, I've heard about what happens in England, that the sun never shines, <laughs> permanently cold. But I remember my geography, and I know that the further you went from the equator, the colder it got. <laughs> so this is a map of England, <laughs> where my scholarship is supposed to take me. So this is the equator. I'm looking for whichever <laughs> university was closest <laughs> to the equator, because that's where I'm going. <laughs> that's great. And I got admitted to uh, <laughs> Edinburgh, and I got admitted to another one, both of them in the wilds of Scotland. <laughs> And so I came further down, and well, Leeds wasn't exactly on the equator, but it was south <laughs> of uh, Edinburgh, and uh, the other one, the, no, it wasn't Sheffield, I'm <laughs> going to remember now, Aberdeen, Aberdeen, Aberdeen. Aberdeen. <laughs> so I said, Leeds, here we come, and that's how I got to Leeds. <laughs> that's great. N closest in England to the equator. <laughs> <laughs> that's great.